So I'm going to start by asking two questions. What is information and what can it do for you? So what is it? Well, it's a patterning of speech such that the patterns have the domain of the utterance. Now, of course, an utterance can be very short. So if you say, oh, that's an utterance, and that has intonation. But more normally, we think of intonation as having its domain, having as its domain something like the clause or the sentence or some similar structural unit. The crucial thing about intonation is that it doesn't change the identity of the words. If you know about a tone language such as Mandarin Chinese, there the pitch patterns change the identity of the segments, the lexical identity of the segments, but uh, as, as can stress or length. But intonation is independent of the words. You can use any intonation and the words that you access from your mental lexicon won't be changed. What is intonation made of? I've already mentioned pitch and sometimes intonation is defined simply in terms of pitch. But there's always other stuff going on along with pitch patterns. So loudness, length, also the kind of voice quality you produce with your larynx. So one of the patterns I'll be talking about is a falling, rising pattern. Maybe you're hesitating and you say, yes. And often when you go down to the bottom of the pitch range, you're also doing creaky voice, the kind of, uh, that kind of effect. So these things work, work together. And if we're talking about intonation, as you'll see in the diagram that's coming up, we need to distinguish things, uh, parameters you can measure in the phonetics laboratory, perceptual dimensions, so what your ear and brain make of those dimensions, and then, as a third stage, the linguistic systems. So in this diagram at the right, we're looking here at intonation, and it's saying, well, intonation recruits or depends upon various dimensions that you can hear. There's pitch, loudness, there's your perception of the length of bits of speech, particularly vowels, of course, and as I mentioned, laryngeal voice quality. So it's not simply that intonation is pitch or that it simply uses pitch. There's a complex of perceptual sensations underlying intonation. And then, though it's not going to worry us much tonight, but you can say, well, pitch is mainly dependent on fundamental frequency, how often the speech wave is repeating per second. So this is, this is what you can measure in hertz. Intensity is what you can measure in decibels. Duration in milliseconds. And, well, that's harder to find a, uh, a measurement of. But this is what you can measure in the laboratory. This is what your ear and brain make of it. And then this is what language uses those dimensions for. So you also have systems like tone. Tone, as I said before, changes the identity of the word in tone languages. And if you speak a Germanic language, particularly if you speak English, there's also an interaction with vowel quality because stress and intonation are very closely tied up. Stress in English depends a lot, or lack of stress depends on not having any vowel quality other than uh, or hardly any vowel quality. Second question that I put at the beginning, what can intonation do for you? Well, it conveys information beyond the words in the utterance, and we'll look at some of these grammatical, semantic information about the discourse and the interaction between two people who are talking, your attitude, and it also, as you'll be aware of in your own languages, is one of the things that makes people who speak a different dialect sound different. So what about grammatical structure? So, in a way, intonation is the punctuation of speech. It marks divisions between grammatical units, and it helps the listener parse or group the utterance in a way that's helpful for understanding the grammar. So, for instance, if I say 
while eating my dog, my cat and I watch television, you have a rather unpleasant picture of um, uh, two, a cat and me, eating a dog. If you get the intonation right, while eating, my dog, my cat and I watch television, you have a much more pleasant domestic scene. And similarly with your commas, your punctuation, you could get the same thing. So it's telling you what words go with what. It's telling you here, wrongly, we hope that dog goes with being eaten. It's important to realize that grammatical structure doesn't map directly onto prosodic structure. Grammar really says, here are places where you might want to make uh, the end of an intonational phrase or a prosodic phrase. Because the boundaries, the phrases that you make in intonation will depend on things like speech rate, how clear you want to be. So you can say, for instance, if you're ready, we'll go, if you're speaking very clearly. You can also say, if you're ready, we'll go. There's nothing different grammatically about these two utterances, but the difference of intonational phrasing is to do with clarity, explicitness, and very often speech rate. Another example of a, I'm never quite sure whether it's grammar or semantics, but the difference between restrictive and non-restrictive relative clauses. So one might say the Norwegians who are rich enjoy life to the full. And if you do that with two intonational phrases, that is restricting your set of Norwegians to those who are rich. It's a restrictive relative clause. It doesn't need a comma there. It doesn't need the intonation equivalent of a comma. On the other hand, if you put the intonational comma in there, the Norwegians who are rich enjoy life to the full. You're actually assuming or implying that all Norwegians are rich and they have good lives. So that um, difference between restrictive and non-restrictive relatives is important to signal, can be signaled by intonation. What about this example? So this is apposition versus what is sometimes called epithets. If we take this sentence, the deer was shot by John, the butcher. The butcher is adding extra information to John. It's the apposition. John's job is being a butcher. He presumably wants to sell deer meat. If you say, the deer was shot by John, the butcher, no pitch accent, no strong stress here. This becomes not his career, but it becomes uh, a criticism, it becomes an epithet, it becomes your negative description of him. So by choosing an intonation pattern with pitch accent here, not choosing it there, you get a semantic difference. This you can't do it in every language. Romance languages seem not to be able to do this. I don't know whether Dutch, Flemish uh, can do it, but um, it certainly works in English. Another thing that intonation buys you is highlighting bits of information that are important, uh, often in contrast, but not necessarily. So if somebody's uh, talking to you about an arrangement to meet at the railway station to catch a train, you might say, I'll be there about five. If they then say, okay, I'll book, a ticket, I'll book two tickets on the two minutes past five train, you might say, I'll be there about five. I said about five. So you shift, sorry, you shift the intonation nucleus, the main stress, if you like, from the last word, the last content word, where it often is by default, to the word that you're contrasting. And if you say um, to an English speaker something like this, but don't de-accent the last word, so not the pattern that I've got here, you say, I offered her coffee, but it turns out she doesn't drink coffee. So you accent coffee the second time, it actually 
garden paths listeners, it makes them confused because when they hear coffee the second time with an accent, they think, oh, what was it in the first course? The natural native speaker way to do it for Brits and Americans is to say, I offered her coffee, but it turns out she doesn't drink coffee. This is de-emphasized, it's de-accented internationally because it's been mentioned before. And this helps you, if you like, not pay much attention to that, to pay less attention because it's not highlighted. Doesn't work in all languages, doesn't really work in most romance languages, doesn't even work in all varieties of English. So a student of mine studied Singapore English. Singapore English speakers are perfectly happy to accent coffee the second time in that sentence. And there are curious little corners of intonation like this one. So if um, you, as a gentleman, you go up to a lady to dance and ask her to dance, um, and she says, I don't dance with anyone. Well, you can feel disappointed, but not personally insulted, because she's simply saying, I don't dance. If she says, I don't dance with anyone, this falling rising pattern implies that I would dance with somebody who's worth it. So there, you can feel insulted. And this falling rising pattern here has that particular implication of but following, and with this particular combination uh, uh, the negative polarity item, is that the correct term? Um, the second one is a free choice item. The second? The second one is a free choice item. Oh, a free choice item, okay. okay. It's grammar you see on the side. But, you know, that's something you can do with intonation. Um, again, just sort of looking at odd little corners of English intonation, you might wonder why we would always say the telephone rang where normally we accent the verb in a noun plus verb kind of construction, subject plus verb. Well, it's probably because what else did the telephone do sensibly? You wouldn't de-accent exploded. Then the telephone exploded. You wouldn't say then the telephone exploded unless you were in customs press. And very curiously, um, the correct thing to say if you notice flames and smoke coming from somebody's trousers, the natural English thing to say is, look, your trousers are on fire. Now you might think that trousers are not the most interesting item there, but on fire is perhaps the more urgent and unusual thing. But this is what we would say. Uh, you'd say to somebody who was about to sit on a chair that we knew was broken, you'd say, watch out, that chair's broken. I'm not sure why that is, but I think it's just the equivalent of pointing, you're basically saying trousers or chair. Discourse function. Well, the non-linguist, if they know anything about intonation, is that it is that questions rise. And like a lot of facts in the world, a lot of facts on the internet. It's partly true, but it's more complicated than that. So you can find most English and probably Germanic in general WH questions falling. So if you say, what are you doing on Saturday? Get far more common than we fall there. How old is it? Again, it's a fall, not a rise. Yes, no. <clears throat> yes, no questions. So questions which in English we do by um, inversion, um, those can rise very happily. Have you finished the article? This one? Or have you finished the article? If anything, this is more British, this is a more American intonation pattern. Um, but they don't have to. So, very frequently, one says things like, Have you finished the article? The listener already knows this question because the grammar or the morphology has done that job right at the beginning of the utterance. It's a question coming up because of what's happening here. But in fact, I also ask questions like this, which should really be a statement in terms of pattern. So you finished the article. As long as I make this high enough, then the fall is a perfectly good way to make that a question. It's not perfectly good because my non-native 
speaker, PhD students tend not to um, realize it's a question of the silence when I say that was a question. Oh, oh yes, yes, I have finished this, yes. You may, if you watch American or Australian or even British TV, have come across the high rising terminal. This is a much commented on phenomenon where young people rise at the end of every course. I can't do it very well, I'm too old, I don't have it in my native international pattern. But you could imagine John Smith arriving at the doctor's um, office, the doctor's surgery, and saying, my name's John Smith, I've got an appointment with Dr. Samson. Now, the older generation, certainly for many years, would say, why is that young man asking? Surely he knows he's John Smith. Um, Truly, the reception is closed that used to see Dr. Sanderson. Well, um, we'll come on to what it might mean in a moment. Uh, why it's interesting is that it's not a question, but it has a rise. And that is, in a way, curious. It's certainly something which strikes the ear of the older generation speaker who had previously not encountered this pattern. It's also often pointed out that some dialects of English, and we'll hear an example in a little while, um, only have rises, so they don't have any falls. Actually, those rises are different. They're rise plateaus, so the pitch rises, and then if there are enough words, it flattens out. And in fact, it's been claimed that the rises are really falls, but. Um, in some cases, it does seem rather like the high rising terminal, but it's not the same. However, it's not a straightforward fall of the statements. What does the HRT, it's not hormone replacement therapy, it's high rising terminal, what does it mean? Well, people who don't have it often disparage it as sounding like uncertainty or um, uh, deference. But I think it's basically a politeness strategy. It, it may be to do with deference because you're not being uh, threatening to the other person. You're making it clear that you're, you're being non-threatening. Um, so you know the purpose of this when John Smith arrives at the doctor's surgery is he is just being polite. If the receptionist gives him or get, he gets some wrong information, he's being with something called Joe Smart. He'll then say, my name's John Smith. He'll be more forceful, he'll be perhaps less polite, and he'll use a form. Intonation can convey attitude. So there are various strategies for being polite. One is to expand pitch range. Um, we may use particular intonation patterns. And at the same time, our speech output, including things like pitch range, will be shaped by things that are not under our control. So our physiological, our psychological state, if we're afraid, then that may well be evident in the way that we're speaking. But one has to be careful here because there is an overlap or a, a fuzzy boundary between the attitude that you're intending to convey and the effect on your speech that uh, a, a state, your psychological or physical state will have. So for instance, anger is a psychological state, but we may be very angry, but for interpersonal reasons, we have to suppress that anger and not sound as if we're angry. Or we can make ourselves sound angry when we're actually not. So, the kind of example I'm thinking of here is if a small child does something that's actually very funny but potentially dangerous in the future to the child and in order to convey the message you put on the effects of anger even though inside you find it really quite funny. These sort of attitudinal signals, it's been argued, might be you know, when we intend to sound something, it may be because there is an actual 
historic animal based um, uh, reason for it. So one of the kind of chains of reasoning which has been talked about is the use of high pitch. So we use ten, most languages tend to use high pitch for politeness. Um, so you kind of extend your pitch range or you have a rise at the end of your utterance. And the chain of reasoning that might come from a wish to sound deferent, deferent you're, you're giving way to the other person and that may be a form of submissiveness, conventionalized submissiveness, which originally may be because you're a small animal and the last thing you want to do is to challenge the big animal, the leader of the pack, and um, smallness is associated with high pitch. So the smaller your larynx, the higher your pitch will be. So some of intonation may actually have a basis in a very non-linguistic kind of signaling system uh, throughout many parts of the animal kingdom. Discourse regulation. So when two people are talking, particularly when they're talking on the telephone and they have nothing but the sound to guide them, it has been observed that the interaction is very, very tightly coordinated. So you, one person doesn't speak and then there's a five second pause before the other one realizes that the first person has stopped speaking and begins to speak. The gap is fractions of a second rather than seconds. And of course that's quite important on the telephone because silence often is taken to mean that the connection has dropped. So silence on the radio, silence on the telephone is awkward. Now how is it that that very tight coordination is achieved, well it's because the speaker will be using various intonational cues to the fact that he or she wishes to continue talking or has finished what they consider to be their turn. So it's things like low pitch, going quieter, slowing down. So if we compare these two, uh, which is inviting the other speaker to, to chip in with something to say, and then we went to the shopping centre. Or, and then we went to the shopping centre. I think low pitch, slowing down, that's the one which makes it clear that you're happy for the other person to take over the conversation. This you might use if you're afraid they want to, but you aren't going to give way. You have more to say, and they have to listen. And the last thing I'm going to mention is the role of intonation in doing that job of signaling your identity. You all have an accent, whatever language you speak, and part of that accent will be intonation. And with intonation, it's often the case that one group of people will regard the other lot as being very sing-song, and possibly group B will regard the first lot as being very monotonous or boring or flat in their intonation. Uh, at the very north of Scotland there are the Orkney Islands and then the Shetland Islands and those two communities of a few thousand people differentiate themselves. The Orkney Islanders are the ones who are sing-song and the Shetlanders they think speak, speak normally and I'm sure the Orkney Islanders think the Shetlanders sound boring. And if you look at English, even within the British Isles, um, it's very rich in international variation. So here's a speaker of something like the modern equivalent of RP or BBC English. Once upon a time, there was a girl from Sudan, but then put up with the standards. Can you hear that all right? Is there any extra? Maybe this is. Once upon a time, there was a government syndrome, but then one would have sent us. Yeah. So that's. Um, oh, I'm mean, going to have to speak quieter. Once upon a time, there was a girl called Cinderella. But everyone calls her Cinderella. That's Welsh, English. Once upon a time, there was a girl called Cinderella, but everybody calls her Cinderella. 
Notice in that one how the pitch is going up at the end of each clause. Similar, but not from Northern Ireland, from Newcastle. So if we look at these, just the put a sentence. Put a sentence. This is a spectrogram, and it shows the um, shows the spectral content, the the acoustics of the segments, and these blue dots on top show the pitch. So this chap says that way called her Cinders, Cinders. The Welsh speaker at uh, top right, if I can find it. Called her Cinders. Not very different, it's going down in the same way, but you can see that the Cinders, there's much more of a fall on the second syllable. The Northern Irish speaker at bottom left. Called her Cinders. You can see very clearly from the blue dots Cinders, um, and a similar pattern in the Newcastle speaker. So that's just one tiny corner of international variation in British English. Those are the things that intonation can do for you. My next question, but a lot of the talk is going to be about whether intonation is phonological. I can actually turn the sound down slightly because I... My so how, how many of you have studied phonology at all? Not many. Oh, not that you can remember. Um, phonology is things like phony, so it's the set of sounds that the language has and the patterns that the sounds can uh, fall into in a particular language. So one of the things that characterizes phonology is that you have a, a set, a limited number of discrete categories. So you have an L, an S, a, a vowel, A in English, the things which the alphabet captures better or worse. And if you've done phonology, you'll know that one of those elements isn't always the same. So there's a variable relationship, a variable mapping between that element and the way you actually speak it. So in English, if you've uh, learned English from a textbook, it will have told you that at the beginning of a word like leaf, you have a, an L that sounds like l leaf, whereas at the end of a word like feel, you have an L that sounds like L. And if you get them the wrong way around, people will still understand you, but it will sound odd for BBC English. So you'd say something like leaf and feel. That's just allophones. That's the variance of those particular categories. Those sound categories don't have a meaning. There's no sense in asking, what's the meaning of L in English? What's the meaning of A in English? They only mean when they're put into combination with other elements. And another thing that phono phonology does is to tell you what the possible orderings of segments is. So in English, you can have a word like snow or snug with an S followed by an N at the beginning. You can't have a word beginning F, N. So you can't have a word FNUG, F, N, U, G. There was a quilt manufacturer with that name, FNUG. It is no longer in business. Whether for that reason or because they were bad quilts, I don't know. And that's not actually too bad a violation of phonotactics. You can have much worse if you had um, PTSK at the beginning of a word, that would be completely unpronounceable in English and I think every language. So the question is, is intonation phonological? Does it involve something comparable to these meaningless abstract units like the phonemes of a language?
or, as has often been thought, and the, what I said about animal communication rather suggests this might be the case, do we map meaning directly into pitch um, and the other dimensions? This is the crucial bit. The answer will turn out to be both. Now this caused it to be a very long time before intonation was properly understood because one lot of researchers were working on the assumption that intonation was like animal communication. The other lot were working on the assumption that it was just like phonemes and, and allophones. It's both because it does make use of categories in the same way that all linguistic structure makes use of categories, structured language. And these categories may be things like a rise, a fall, the fall rise, which I've mentioned previously. But language also makes, intonation also makes use of direct signaling, gradient signaling, for instance, in the use of pitch range. So discrete invariant abstract categories, they have variable realization, they have a variable relation to meaning, uh, as you see here. So this is the fall rise, one of the categories in a particular kind of intonation analysis. Yes, possibly. It's a possible solution. And you can probably judge intuitively that this is the same sort of utterance. It's just that there are more syllables, more words in the third one. What is striking is that the four rise doesn't always occur on the first syllable. Now, many years ago, in the early days of speech synthesis, I heard a speech synthesizer which had been programmed with a bit of intonation but it didn't know this. And for this utterance, it would have said, it's a possible solution. It's a possible solution doing the whole fall rise on the first syllable. Not, doesn't work, and you have to know the rule of contextual variation for that pattern. What about meaning? Well, this is a very good pattern to use if you want to do continuation. So you might say, it's a possible solution, and you should try it at once. It's also the same pattern that can be used to give an, a reservation if you're not happy with it. You might say it's a possible solution and say nothing else. And that means you don't think it's really a solution at all. So there isn't a fixed meaning for this pattern. It's got several uses, and the uses may depend on the context. So to this extent, intonation is very like what we saw with the phonemes, the L and the S and the A. And we can use the categories, as you've seen, to make questions. So if I just say T, then you know I'm asking you a question. It's just elliptic, elliptical for would you like a cup of tea. But the rise doesn't mean a question because you might use a rise also for listing. So if I say, oh, I'm going shopping, I need coffee, tea, and sugar. It's not asking a question, it's simply indicating continuation. So you've got those, at least those two meanings for the rise as well. Here's the other part, the gradient part. So you might be um, asked if you want to meet somebody. Francis Nolan is coming to give a lecture. You might say, I'd love to meet him which is pretty much a fact. You might say, I'd love to meet him. You might say, it's unlikely. You might say, I'd love to meet him. So you actually scale your pitch range according to the, your genuine enthusiasm, or perhaps the enthusiasm that you feel it's appropriate to show in this particular circumstance. And there is a catch here that at either end, you can sound ironic. So if you say, I'd love to meet him, then it doesn't mean what words should mean. And probably at the other end, if you say, I'd love to meet him, it doesn't sound genuine either. But most of the time, we do this kind of gradient scaling to indicate degrees of a continuum of involvement in the, the matter. Right, now I'm coming on to the discovery part. How is it that we know what we know about intonation? 
Well, the so-called British school, it's called British simply because that's where it developed, really reached its peak in the middle of the last century. And a lot of the research, or the less research actually, but it was the codification of intonation was for the purpose of teaching English to foreign learners of English. And I'm going to give a very selective history, and the theme running through it is how we got to the point where we realized that intonation had a phonology rather like the way the segments have a phonology. And then I will compare the British model very, very briefly to a model which some of you may have come across and which is currently dominant. This is what it um, looks like, in, certainly in textbooks. So you have often this kind of diagram, which is a bit like a musical stave. This utterance would be, there's no need to interfere with it. There's no need to interfere with it. And this diagram, which is sometimes called a tadpole diagram, because this looks like a little baby frog, the pre-frog frog, um, is a sort of phonetic representation. It's not a, a physical, it's not something you can measure in the phonetics laboratory, because it already has abstraction built into it. It's making a decision that these are stressed syllables and these are unstressed syllables. And it's sometimes making a decision that you can hear pitch movement on this syllable but not on this syllable. But I think the, the way in which it's iconic is relatively straightforward. And then if you look up here, these are the categories. So this is your friend the four eyes that you've come across quite often. Iconic symbols are normally used and they're put before stressed syllables. This is indicating the gradual falling pattern that's occurring on. No need to, no need to enter so this gradually drifting down pattern. And the intonational phrase, as we nowadays call it, is seen as being um, having its own structure. So there are three or four parts to the structure by the time we get to the, the sort of end point of the development of this model. So the most important is the nucleus. Um, some people separate out this particular stress syllable from the unstressed syllables and call it the tail. That's actually a bit of a distraction. I think that's a waste of time. Then from the first accented syllable, it's called the head. And then there's any unstressed syllables before that, which is called the prehead. Terminology varies, but that's the basic um, point to which we come in about 1950. What about early work on intonation? So even in the 16th century, people are writing about punctuation um, and trying to relate what punctuation does to the pitch of the voice. In the 17th century, this author Butler says, Quite correctly, the question mark raiseth the common tone or tenor of the voice in the last word, but if it begin with a word interrogative, such as who, what, how, where, why, etc., it falleth as a full stop or period. Um, so he's got precisely the thing I was saying earlier, that WH questions usually fall. Then the chap who I am so impressed by, um, Joshua Steele was a gentleman scholar. I have always really wished to be a gentleman phonetician, but I didn't have the family wealth behind me to enable this. But anyway, Joshua Steele, who was a very inquisitive chap, had a bit of a, a, bit of a dispute with a chap who was a lord, Lord Monbodo, because Lord Monbodo had mouthed off about intonation, and he said, English has accents, but there is no change of tone in them. It's merely like the beating of a drum. Well, good old Joshua Steele thought about it and said, I think he's wrong. I think there is tone or pitch movement in English. So he got his bass viol, which is a bit like a cello, an early um, instrument, uh, stringed instrument. And using his ear, he subdivided the notes into quarter tones, semitones divided into quarter tones. And stuck a piece of paper on his on the neck of his vial and used that as his phonetics laboratory to judge his own intonation when doing things like 
the speeches from Shakespeare. Not a method that we use very much <laughs> nowadays, but uh, a very good start. And he came up with this amazing notation, which of course is, is musical in nature, as using the stave with the lines still there, unlike the platform diagram we showed you earlier. And for basically each syllable, he's marking what he hears as the pitch movement within that syllable. He's marking um, syllables according to their weight or length as musical notes, long notes, minimums, crotchets, quavers. He's also giving a separate notation here for emphasis. It may be more like rhythm, in fact. So he's talking about three categories. He's, to this extent, categorizing heavy syllables, light syllables, and even lighter syllables with um, two dots. There's one. And he's also doing stuff which very few intonation researchers did subsequently until actually 1969 when David Crystal did a, an amazingly detailed study of intonation. So he's noting where he's going louder, like a crescendo mark on uh, music. And these mean um, quiet, and the other similar thing means forte or loud. So it's um, incredibly detailed, incredibly subtle, completely original. So not like most scholars today who build on what's been done before. Pleasingly, the outcome was that Lord Lombardo said, well, yeah, I think you're right, actually. I, I, I got it all wrong. So he wrote a very gracious letter in the way that people did in those days. And this is all correspondence between them, which then got published as a book. But um, Joshua Steele certainly convinced him that there was intonation in English. The analysis is, doesn't get us very far, actually, towards phonology. I did say that he had categories of emphasis. But with the, the pitch movements, it's really like the tadpole diagram. It's not giving you categories. Henry Sweet, this is jumping right ahead to the mid to late 19th century. He um, was one of the first people to try and pin down categories within intonation. And so he had examples like this. Um, Do you object to tobacco smoke? Not at all. Something that they used to say in the 19th century, wouldn't be allowed to say it in the 21st century. Um, and he came up with these kinds of pattern rise and the four and the four others, so six contrasting phones. And he also talked about pitch range, rather as I did with the I'd love to meet him. Um, so that is phonological. He has stepped over the line into phonology. So the inventory of tones is actually pretty much like what you get half a century later. However, you'll notice that those symbols, the rise and the fall, were at the ends of phrases. What he fails to make explicit is that the rise and the fall are anchored onto stressed or prominent or accented syllables. It looks as though they belong to the whole intonational phrase, or as he called it, the whole breath group. And unlike later authors, he didn't recognize any uh, structure, internal structure to the international phrase. If we just tabulate where we've got to so far, so all these things are going to be in the final column. Um, Butler, well, one of the things he recognizes is that um, an international category doesn't have a meaning, so he's prepared to dissociate prizes from questions and forms from statements. Um, Steele is basically doing a very, very good narrow phonetic description, but he's not thinking in terms of categories, whereas Sweet comes in with a lot of kicks, a lot of pluses, um, but he doesn't see that the crucial patterns hang on to stressed syllables, and he doesn't do any of this breaking down of the international phrase into sub-parts. But we'll speed on, and Harold Palmer, I think, 
set the foundation for the full system that you get in the middle of the century. So he recognized an explicit structure to the international phrase. He talked about head and nucleus and tail. He gave an inventory of nuclear tones, the patterns that can occur on the last accented syllable, and a smaller inventory of head patterns, and he discussed pitch range. So I won't go into this, but this is his inventory of falls, fall rise, um, a low rising pattern. This is his inventory of nuclear tones. And um, his analysis would be something like that. So this utterance would be, what a remarkably pretty little house. And he divides into nucleus, plus pale if there are more words, and then a head, which in this case, this kind of reduplicated rising pattern he calls a standard head. So he's much more phonological than previous work. He has internal structure to the international phrase. He's very concerned whether um, the choices are significant. He agonizes over whether two audibly different patterns actually mean something different. And he talks about co-occurrence restrictions or phonotactic restrictions. So this is the snug versus snug thing. He says it's doubtful whether the low rising nucleus is ever preceded by an inferior head. So he's looking for those kind of phonotactic restrictions. And he also very perceptively doesn't do what a lot of people do, which is to say, well, the nucleus is the most prominent syllable. He says that that depends on what the patterns are. Uh, the nucleus is actually the last accent, not necessarily the most prominent accent. I think I will skip through Roger Kingdon. He was another contributor. He would have an analysis like this. Just very briefly, what he um, added was recognition that you could have unstressed syllables, which can also have contrasting patterns. Unstressed syllables at the beginning of the utterance. And this he calls a pre-head. So with Kingdon, we come to the full system of pre-head, head, and nucleus. Except he, I think, rather misguidedly separates the accented syllable at the beginning of the head from the rest of it, and calls the rest of the body. Incidentally, if you're a syntactician, you'll find this term um, confusing, because in syntax, heads are the things that define the unit that have to be there. Whereas in intonation analysis, it's very much the nucleus which defines the nature of the intonational phrase. Um, it was a very elaborate system, and possibly too elaborate, but it certainly influenced subsequent writers. You may even have come across O'Connor and Arnold in learning English, their textbook um, on uh, intonation of colloquial English was very widely used, very influential. And it's a kind of synthesis and slight sim well, considerable simplification of kingdom, also underpinned by Palmer's work. So they take up this three or four part structure of the international phrase. They group functionally equivalent combinations into tone groups and they're concerned with phonotactics, as this table shows. So prehead, head, nucleus, and the various types, low, high prehead, low, stepping, sliding, high, fall, head, various nuclear types. And they say, for instance, if you have a fall rise nucleus, um, you have a falling or high fall head. These are the possible combinations with also the possibility of a tail. You can always have a tail. That's why it's not a very significant point of choice. There is actually no choice for the intonation of the tail. So this is a table of phototactics. I know it's a bit hard to, to take it in straight away, but they are doing the phototactics. So going back to this table, Yes, O'Connor and Arnold, I think, tick all the boxes for being phonological. Kingdom ticks most of them. He, he doesn't actually talk very much about phonotactics because his description is so detailed that you can have almost anything 
followed by anything. And Palmer does a very good job. The only thing that he hadn't yet thought about was these unstressed symbols at the beginning of the international phrase, namely prehead. So by the mid 20th century, we had all these elements inventory of categories, mapping to phonetic realization, though of course this is all in an auditory phonetic era. It's very hard to do instrumental analysis in the first, uh, until the second half of the 20th century. And the recognition that an international category has a very real relationship to meaning and to realization, that there is an internal structure to the phrase, and that there may be a need for an international phonal tactics. So it's a fully phonological framework. I gave a version of this talk with sort of more emphasis on the, the history of the British school, which I called the rise and fall of the British school of intonation. A little joke, you see, it's rise and fall. And so why did it fall? Why has it fallen? Well, it came up against a very stiff competitor, namely the auto metrical model of intonation analysis, which is, as the name suggests, closely related to auto-segmental phonology, which developed actually for tone languages. And that is different superficially in a very dramatic way. Uh, very generally, what the intonation does, what pitch does in speech is it goes up and down. It goes up and down. And of course, if something is going up and down, we've been assuming that you talk about it in terms of rises and falls and possibly fall rises in combination. But you can also look at the high bits and the low bits, and that's what auto segmental phonology does. It talks in terms of the targets or the turning points in pitch contours. So by doing that, the descriptions look very different. But actually, most of the time, you can convert from the British school into an auto segmental metrical description, or vice versa. But there may be testable predictions that can help you decide that one is theoretically better than the other. And the proponents of AM, auto segmental metrical, say the following. Let's take a consonant vowel, consonant vowel sequence and see what a rise looks like. And this work was done on Greek. And they found that the rise tended to be anchored, the bottom bit tended to be anchored at the beginning of the first vowel, and the top was anchored at the beginning of the second vowel. Very cunningly, they then constructed material where this vowel would be a long vowel. And we then wait with great excitement to know what the rise does. Does it do this? So it's exactly the same pattern. And it finishes within the long vowel rather than after the next consonant. They discovered it doesn't. It does this. So it's a shallower rise, but the H is still in the equivalent place. It's at the beginning of the second vowel. And they say, therefore, H and L are things the speaker cares about and aligns with the vowels and consonants, whereas the slope is just a uh, secondary consequence of those H's and L's. Now, there are ways of uh, arguing against that, but it is quite a clever and sensible argument. That's not really the reason why um, auto-segmental metrical analysis has taken over. That's more to do with the fact that it, and not to the British school, it was incorporated into modern methods of phonetic analysis, so using computers to look at the pitch curve, measuring things, and the British um, tradition rather perhaps dropped the ball and they didn't um, get involved in uh, instrumental phonetics. If we compare that original utterance, you remember, there's no need to interfere with it, but you've seen that analysis, you've seen the British analysis. Here's the 
um, sort of orthodox AM analysis. So you can see it doesn't actually recognize these divisions of the international phrase, even though they often talk about the nucleus, they don't believe in it. And they have mainly pitch accents. So this utterance would actually consist of two low plus high pitch accents, where the star means this is the term that goes on the stressed syllable. And they also have boundary tones, so they associate a particular high or low, or occasionally a combination, with the boundary. And that, I think, is actually right. There are good advantages for having at least one boundary tone. They managed to have two, which is a bit tricky at times. I'm nearly finished. Am I okay for time? The next slide is a summary and conclusion. So I'll just don't worry. It's all under control. Um, so a lot of things. This is British school, auto segmental metrical school. Most of the, uh, in many ways, they are equivalent. So you can, can express the contrasts in both systems. This is where they're different. Pitch movements versus targets. Nucleus matters. There's no such thing as a nucleus, but you do have a final pitch accent and boundary tone. I'll skip that one. One level of phrasing, two levels. That's an accident, really. Um, the AM model is actually implemented in speech synthesis. So it has rules. In for some people anyway, there are rules which have been devised to make it work in the synthesizer. That's not true really of the British school. British school is mainly for teaching um, all the kind of technological research, speech technology research, that's tended to use AM um, as, its, as its model. And partly because of the era in which it grew up, the British tradition relies on listening. So does AM. It's not sensible just to look at pitch patterns on the computer, but um, it has this huge advantage that it does massive amounts of quantitative analysis. So, intonation is difficult. Our present understanding evolved over quite a long time period. Um, by the middle of the last century, there was a well-worked out model that was certainly good for teaching. And the insight, which was a long time coming, was that intonation has one foot in categorical language, the language system that has all its categories, and it has one foot outside. So it's also a little bit like animal communication. Uh, AM dominates, but there is a way of converting very simply between most analysis, most patterns in. AM expression expressed in terms of AM and patterns that we've seen in the British school. Um, it may be that falls and rises are actually easier to learn if you're trying to learn the intonation of the foreign language. Um, there's lots to be discovered yet, so this is a very active research field still. And above all, like Joshua Steele, never believe what people tell you about language, test it out for yourselves even if you haven't got a base file. That's it. Convincing and uh -huh. stronger. I find that very strange. 
Okay, so I don't know whether you all heard that, but in Portuguese, men go higher in pitch if they want to be more authoritative or more convincing. Um, these things, even though the maybe, I mean, this is just a hypothesis that the, uh, the the conventions of intonation are somehow traceable back to animal communication. But in any case, there's always the possibility for a culture, for a language community, to step in and do things which are. Um, independent of any kind of explanation like that. So I think in Japanese it's been noted that uh, for women certainly to be polite involves going to very high pitch, but not for men, they go to very low pitch or lower than normal pitch. So yeah, I mean, language uh, less, less so in phonemes in terms of segmental phonology, but within intonation there's always the chance for uh, the patterns to take on a life of their own and lose any connection with previous uh, usages or even well-motivated usages. So the use of rises for statements seems curious. Uh, the finality of a statement may be related to the fact that as we speak we use up the air, so we're generally going down in pitch when we get to the end of a chunk that we wish to convey. But there are these dialects which go up at the end rather than down even for expressing finality. There also the question about mm -hmm. the national nucleus, because you said uh, the anti-segmental metrical theory doesn't use or doesn't believe actually in the notion of nucleus. Um, um, I would be happy to hear it more about that because usually, I mean, at least for some people working in the auto-segmental framework, uh, nucleus is actually what is the head of a phrase. So yeah. it's much, it's a bit syntactic-like notion of, notion of uh, headness. Yeah, so the, the question is about the, um, the loss of the nucleus in the auto-segmental model. And that is certainly true in the original formulation of it. So Janet, for Janet Pierre Humbert, all pitch accents were equal. And there wasn't a specially privileged pitch accent being the, uh, the last one of the nuclear pitch accent. And I think that actually is to do with the fact that there are boundary tones in AM. So the work of the nucleus is being shared between the last pitch accent and the boundary tones. Now, you used the, your comment was that people working in AM actually recognize the, nu the nucleus, that last pitch accent, as being important because it is the head in the syntactic sense, in the sense I mentioned, which is confusing of the international phrase. And that, that makes a lot of sense. That's, that's what you have to have there to have an international phrase. So, yes, I think it's the, me saying that the nucleus was got rid of is perhaps too much of an exaggeration. But it, it was a sort of article of faith in the orthodoxy that the nucleus uh, wasn't a significant concept at one stage. 